Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to the ADB's 50th annual meeting sessions of dialogue between civil society and ADB's management, as represented by President Masasugu Asakawa, or President Masa. I'm especially um, want to welcome our civil society participants to this event. I am Heidi Ear Dupree, head of the NGO Civil Society Center at the ADB and your moderator for this hour. Let me quickly go over the flow of today's sessions. Following a brief remark by President Massa, I will ask three questions that we selected from those submitted by some of you ahead of the annual meeting. There will be a dialogue. After that, there will be a dialogue uh, with four civil society representatives, followed by a moderated Q&A sessions. Today, we will be using Pigeonhole Live for our Q&A sessions. Pigeonhole Live is a simple interactive mobile website where you can submit questions to the panel of speakers. You can also vote on any questions that interest you. If you're watching us live, all you need to do is to click the Q&A icon on the right side of the page and it will direct you to the session's Q&A. If you have a smartphone or a tablet, you can scan the QR codes you see on the screen or just launch your internet browser and enter www.pigeonhole.at into the address bar. Next, key in our event passcode, which is ADB MNL 55. Once again, ADB MNL 55. If you have any questions throughout the panel discussion, feel free to submit them through Pigeonhole. Questions with the highest number of votes will stand a better chance to be answered by the speakers. I would like to note that this one hour event is one of the many ways you can engage with the ADB. Conversations between civil society and the ADB is an ongoing process throughout the year and throughout the ADB's policy, projects, and program development cycles. We also hear from some of you regularly through exchange of letters and emails. For this meeting with ADB senior management, as represented by President Massa, we seek to listen to your feedback and recommendations from the civil society on ADB's work as a process to strengthen our ADB civil society relations. I encourage you to keep your questions to the policy and institutional level for today. Should a more detailed and project specific questions be raised, we have senior members from all our operations department listening and watching in today's event, and we can get back to you even after this session. You can also send your email to us at civilsociety@adb.org. Again, our, ad our email address is civilsocietyadb.org. And now it is a privilege and a pleasure for me to invite President Massa to provide the opening remarks. President Massa, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Hedi. Uh, well, good morning and welcome to our participants from civil society organizations. It is a great pleasure to meet with you today. This year marks a milestone in our relationship with CSOs. We are celebrating 20 years since the founding of the NGO and Civil Society Center at ADB, your key point of contact for those of you who engage with us on a regular basis. I am here today to listen and learn from your ideas about how we can work together to achieve a more prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and the Pacific. To start our dialogue, let me comment on three key areas of ADB's work that will need your insights and inputs. First, climate challenges threaten our efforts to promote strong and sustainable development if we, we do not put forward ambitious solutions. As ADB develops just and innovative actions to address climate change, we value your support in many ways including one, to identify solutions for transitioning to cleaner energy, two, to help us identify experts who can participate and advise the process of reaching the Paris Agreement goals, and three, to work with us as we scale up decarbonization, adaptation, and resilience investments. I look forward to hearing your ideas on these urgent concerns. Let me turn now to the second theme, the ongoing global health and economic crisis facing our region. The people of our developing member countries are living with food insecurity, <coughs> inflation, 
and the challenges of debt sustainability. In addition, we still need to address social and economic challenges caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. To support our region as we rebuild for a strong and lasting recovery, we are committed to honest and constructive engagement by stakeholders like you in our policy dialogue and implementation of our operations. Let me highlight a final area where we continue to value the role of the CSO community. ADB's institutional policies, including our safeguards. Your participation over the past year in ADB's review of strategic policy documents has been essential. This includes your active engagement in the consultation for ADB's updated energy policy released last October 2021. We have also launched a comprehensive safeguard policy review <clears throat> and update process, which included over 61 consultations with CSOs on 17 topics to date. We highly appreciate your engagement, including your inputs on the importance of strengthening one, safeguard implementation, two, stakeholders participation, three, grievance readiness, and four, protection from reprisals. We look forward to continuing our dialogue on these and other issues. Let me end by thanking you again for the important role you play in our work. I encourage you to keep the conversation going here at our annual meeting and in the days and months ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Massa, for your message. Now, for the rest of the hour, we will have a few minutes dedicated to questions we received from some of you from the survey we've sent out ahead of the annual meeting, followed by conversations between President Massa and four civil society representatives, ending with the Q&A session. I ask you once again to submit your questions in the pigeonhole, and they will be selected to be voted by members of the audience. Please note that the aim is to get back to you even after the event to address your questions. Do, no, do note that you can um, choose to be anonymous if you do not want to identify yourself to us. However, we would not have a way to follow up with you after the event. When you see the questions listed on your screen, please vote for the questions that you would like to be prioritized and to be answered. President Massa, the first question from the survey we sent out um, is from Ms. Joan Doris of the NGO One Small Bag from Wanawatu. Ms. Joan asks, what is ADB doing to try and help countries move away from fossil fuel? President Massa? Ah, okay. Okay, thank you, John, for this very, very important questions. Needless to say, ADB aims uh, to align with the Paris Agreement on climate change. Uh, we are supporting this in a couple of ways. Uh, first, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we devised our energy policy last year. So 2021 energy, new energy policy aims to support universal access to reliable and affordable energy services, while also promoting the low carbon transition in the region. ADB works closely with the governments of each of our developing member countries, TMCs, to plan their development plan. Obviously, under this new uh, energy policy, uh, we officially decided to withdraw our financing uh, from new coal-fired power plants. Uh, second, ADB supports a just energy transition. Uh, this balances development, development and climate goals because both are important to achieve strong and inclusive uh, growth. Uh, we consider the potential impacts on all disadvantaged and vulnerable groups as we plan and implement our uh, projects. And third, ADB is working with our development, developing member countries, TMCs, to invest more in uh, cleaner energy. Our new energy policy formalized our practice of not financing new coal fire power, power and heating plants, as I mentioned. We support a planned phase out of coal in the region. One of our new initiatives is the so-called ETM, Energy Transition Mechanism, uh, which aims to prioritize accelerating the retirement 
uh, of uh, ex already existing coal-fired electricity moving countries to more modern and less polluting alternatives by utilizing so-called blended financing, uh, which combines uh, private financing uh, with uh, highly concessional financing or even grant money provided uh, by uh, donor countries and philanthropies. And uh, by uh, take, uh, taking advantage of this uh, very low cost financing, uh, it could uh, let the existing coal fire power plants retire early. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Joan, for your question. The second question we have is from Mr. Stevie Harrison of Inspirator Muta Nusantara from Indonesia. And he asked, how would digitization affect the way ADB and its operations work with member countries in the coming years? Oh, okay. <clears throat> Digitization is really an you know, inevitable trend that we have to go through together with aging and globalization, in my, in my, in my opinion. Well, ADB places a very high priority on digitalization, uh, both within ADB's internal systems and across ADB operations uh, with our uh, DMCs, European member countries. Uh, we are also increasing our digital investments and the staffing accordingly. We need staff uh, to deal with digitalization within ADP, obviously. So we are supporting a wide range of digitalization efforts, including a couple of things. First, digitalization of traditional infrastructure investments in areas like transport, water, and energy. Second, <clears throat> support for digital infrastructure in DMCs including digital connectivity, e-government systems, earth observation, and national spatial data infrastructure. And third, increased partnerships with technology leaders to support our DMC programs. And finally, fourth, our support for knowledge and policy in digitalization, including increasing our work to help bridge the digital divide and improve data privacy and security in DMCs. You know, talking of uh, digitalization, I think uh, how to address uh, the serious problem of digital divide is really, you know, a crucial thing. So we have to address it uh, uh, at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Stevie, for your question. The third question we have is from Mr. Chad Dodson of the NGO Foundation Earth based in the United States. And Chad asks, what is the bank's plan to update the very old gender policy to reflect current knowledge and be useful for the next generation? Okay. Uh, thank you, Chad. Uh, and this is a question about gender policy. Uh, the current leading strategic document for ADB, ADB's work on gender is a so-called Strategy 2030, Operation Plan uh, for Priority Number 2. Uh, accelerating progress in gender equi uh, equality, uh, 2019 to 2024. Uh, this is abbreviated as OP2. While the principles captured in ADB's policy on gender and uh, de uh, development remain relevant, uh, the process of developing OP2 involved extensive consultation uh, with uh, uh, stakeholders across developing member countries, DMCs, and development partners uh, through multiple online and in-person forums and platforms. OP2 uh, recognizes uh, that gender equality is cr critical uh, in its own right, as well as for helping realize socioeconomic development. And our strategy 2030, which is our medium-term development agenda, OP2 is one of only two OPs uh, alongside OP3 on climate change, with specific high-level corporate targets, numerical targets, uh, namely to support gender equality through gender-inclusive project designs in at least 75%, 75% of its sovereign and non-sovereign operations by 2030. So we have this concrete numerical target for gender equality issue. As we contribute, to accelerating gender equality outcomes in the region under the five strategic pillars of one, economic empowerment, two, human development, three, decision-making and leadership, four, time for poverty reduction, and five, resilience to external shocks. 
we recognize the emerging issues and the new opportunities that exist to address the transformative gender equality agenda in line with SDG 5, as well as increased focus on gender in the private sector as well. Gender issues in private sector is also another critical issue we have to address. The SDGs leave no one behind principle also requires uh, DMCs to address the multiple layers of discrimination against four women, including those related to class, ethnicity, indigenous status, sexual orientation, and gender identity, disability, religion, age and migration. And this has been explicitly reflected in our OP2. Toward this end, uh, we continue to tackle multifaceted and intersectional gender inequalities uh, through integrated solutions, pilot projects, and technical assistance. In particular, we are taking concrete steps to support initiatives aimed at eliminating violence against women and girls, recognizing, reducing, and redistributing unpaid care work, emphasizing sexual and reproductive health and rights, women's participation in decision-making and leadership, and creating access to economic and productive resources, ICT and legal or institutional reforms for prote protecting women's rights and changing gen uh, gendered social norms. Thank you. Thank you, President Massa, and thank you, Chad, for the question. Now, at this time, I have the pleasure to invite four civil society leaders to the discussion today to share their views and ask their questions and converse with President Massa. First, we have Mr. Lagi Siru of the Pacific Island Climate Action Network. Second, we have Mr. Francis Kim Upchi of the International Trade Union Confederation of the Asia Pacific. And third, we have Mr. Hamanta Vitanaj of the Center for Environmental Justice. And then we have Ms. Ritu Tapa, founding member of the Indigenous Women's Legal Awareness Group in Nepal. As much as possible, ADB tries to secure various groups for this dialogue, and each speaker will have three to four minutes to present their topic to be discussed with the president, followed by questions. Let me now call on our first speakers, Mr. Lagi Siru, to present his organization and his question. Lagi, over to you to present a little bit about your organization and ask the president your question. Good morning, Bulavanaka and warm Pacific greetings um, to you, Mr. President Asakawa. Thank you for this opportunity. I represent the Pacific Islands Climate Action Network, a umbrella organization uh, that brings together um, over 135 civil society organizations in the Pacific that are working in the area of climate justice. Firstly, I'd like to begin by underscoring the critical role that youth, indigenous communities and groups, women and other vulnerable populations, such as LGBTQI, are playing in the efforts to build community resilience in the face of the climate crisis. These groups, especially here in the Pacific, have been at the forefront of the fight against climate change and who through their policy interventions and the on the ground action oriented efforts are bringing about meaningful, sustainable, impactful and transformative change to communities and people. Yet despite this, they continue to receive less attention from global multilateral organizations and financial institutions to access much needed resources, both technical and financial, to build their work, replicate best practices, and scale up their initiatives and programs. My question, Mr. Um, uh, President Asakawa, is how is the Asian Development Bank ensuring that as a development bank, it is tackling climate change and driving a positive climate agenda across all aspects of its work? including through on the ground project on climate change and coastal, resi coastal resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Lagi, for your questions. Mr. President, your response, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lagi. Well, as uh, you may know it, uh, uh, this region, Asian Pacific region, is accountable for 
uh, almost uh, more than 50% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And also it's true uh, that this region uh, is one of the most vulnerable uh, area vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, natural disasters. Almost 70% of major natural disasters uh, happened in this area every year. So I keep on saying that our fight against uh, climate change in this region, Asia-Pacific region, uh, will be won or lost. So this region needs to be decarbonized. So having said that, uh, obviously uh, building climate and disaster resilience and enhancing environmental sustainability are among ADB's operational priorities stipulated clearly in our strategy 2030. We also uh, raised our climate financing ambition uh, from 800 billion US dollars to 100 billion dollars uh, from 2019 to 2030 uh, to invest in resilience and adaptation. It's a cumulative climate financing amount, 100 billion for those 12 years. So, uh, Ragi, if you divide 100 billion by 12 years, uh, you will come up with around 8.3 billion uh, per year. Uh, that's our, you know, uh, yearly uh, kind of average ambition, uh, which is very challenging for us. Uh, but we see uh, our investment in uh, green uh, growth as an also as an opportunity uh, to keep uh, advancing development uh, to reduce poverty while uh, maintaining our path uh, to a low carbon transition. Uh, we also commit uh, to fully align uh, our operations to the goals of the Paris, Paris Agreement. By doing so, we aim to help lower the carbon footprint across Asia and the Pacific and help our developing member countries to move their economies towards a more sustainable, resilient, and inclusive future. We also value uh, the participation of local CSOs, our youth groups, and communities in initiatives towards building local resilience. The multi donor facility, so-called Urban Climate Change Resilience Trust Fund, uh, for example, supported local CSOs in engaging with their local governments in improving urban planning and designing and implementing climate resilient infrastructure to protect poor and vulnerable people in the target cities. ADB will also continue to work with key stakeholders, including CSOs, through the so-called Community Resilience Partnership Program, CRPP, which was launched last year. And the program aims to strengthen climate resilience for local communities with a special focus on women and girls. Let me also add that, that this region has been facing increasing uh, climate uh, shocks every year, uh, impacting uh, the health, food, uh, water, and livelihood of millions of people every year. So we see uh, a clear uh, need strong need uh, to invest more in adaptation, not only in mitigation, but also in adaptation. Uh, so as I, as I mentioned, uh, our uh, ambition right now is to invest 100 billion US dollars for climate financing uh, from 2019 to 2030. But out of this 100 billion, we intend uh, to spend at least 34 billion, one third uh, for adaptation. Uh, to uh, you know, enhance the resilience of this uh, region as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Lagi, for your question. Uh, let me now call on the second CSO leader, Mr. Francis Kim Upchi, Director of Economics and Social Policy of the ITUCAP, to present his organizations and raise his question. Francis, over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, President Masa, for your continued dialogue with the trade unions and CSOs. 
The ITUC Asia Pacific represents effectively 6 million workers from 34 countries in the region. And ITUC AP and the ADB, we have been working together on various policy issues since the early 2000s. From your interview session yesterday and also today's remark, I can see the needs of our stronger cooperation to ensure sustainable, inclusive, and resilient Asia in the Pacific against the current challenges with great transformative forces. This and work in particular should be at the center of our path for recovery. As you know, prevailing persistent decent work deficit in our region with a large number of informal and precarious workers is the root of many challenges today. Vulnerability to external shock, further exacerbation without any timely responses, poor essential services, increasing poverty and inequality, as well as persistent difficulty in domestic resource mobilization with eroded tax base among many. In this regard, I have uh, four questions. I mean, your, your idea. Uh, firstly, is about the current review and update of the ADB safeguard policy statement. A comprehensive and binding labor safeguard to realize this and work is our long demand. And we expect this is the time for the ADB to retake its leading role on labor rights and decent work by introducing a binding labor safeguard to cover all projects across their life cycle and all workers throughout the supply chains, in particular to respect core labor standards. Furthermore, a new safeguard policy should come with a more accessible and open accountability mechanism for timely problem solving. I really appreciate your, your response to that. The second point is about your commitment. We, we highly appreciate your commitment to a just transition. According to the ILO guideline for just transition, macroeconomic as well as industrial policies, rights, including occupational safety and health, social protection with active labor market policies, and social dialogue are essential building blocks for a successful just transition. In this regard, it is necessary to have more dialogue on this area at all levels, in particular, the national level with trade union, employers, and other stakeholders participating. I believe the ADB can play an important role in facilitating this. Social dialogue at the national level should be also promoted to strengthen the quality of the labor market assessments, as well as the employment assessment of any ADB projects. Of course, the ILO can join this work based on the MOU between the ADB and ILO. I, I, this, uh, your response would be highly appreciated. Uh, third point is about Sri Lanka. I would like to talk about Sri Lanka. Yes, we need to provide provide urgent social safety net for the vulnerable workers and people. However, we also develop a clear plan for this and work-centered recovery with resilience. Yes, a just transition for Sri Lanka's long-term sustainability and prosperity. And I would like to highlight that there are many ADB member countries with high debt stresses and decent work deficit, in particular the Pacific Islands. In this regard, I would like to listen, your, listen to your idea. The last but not least, I would like to highlight the importance of a labor desk in, in, in the ADB for coordination for projects on decent work and labor rights, including occupational safety and health within the bank, as well as with trade union and CSO. Taking this opportunity, I would like to thank Heidi for your support and cooperation as the CRS senior specialist. And also I appreciate your continued cooperation, definitely under your leadership, President Massa. Thank you very much, President Massa, for this opportunity. Thank you, Francis, for your questions. And President Massa, your response, please. Okay, thank you, Francis. Uh, you, know, you asked actually four points, uh, and uh, every uh, point is so relevant under uh, this very, very, very you know, challenging circumstances. The first point is uh, about uh, 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 safeguard policy. Uh, the core labor standards, so-called CLS, 
uh, covered under ADB's social protection strategy and are operationalized uh, through contracts and loan agreements one by one. ADB conducts due diligence uh, through poverty and social analysis. However, uh, monitoring and compliance review uh, is a bit, bit more limited uh, than for safeguard requirements as it is done through contract management. So, under the safeguard policy update that we are doing now, ADB has undertaken a benchmarking study on labor and working conditions and consulted with DMCs, CSOs, and labor group on this study. Based on these, it is recommended uh, that ADB include a standard on labor and working conditions in the same uh, new, in the new safeguard policy uh, that will align uh, with comparator MFI's standards, multilateral financial institutions standards. This recommendation is being considered under the ongoing safeguard, ongoing safeguard policy review and update. Second, just transition, which is a very complex uh, multidimensional issue. It focuses on ensuring uh, that the negative impacts of climate action on people are anticipated and the challenges and risks of transitions are adequately addressed and creating an environment that generates opportunity, improves livelihood and drives growth. This can be achieved uh, through de developing new industries, businesses, and green quality jobs, strengthening social protection systems and transforming skills and education systems. ADB will invest some additional funds to ensure that the just transition work will be sufficiently supported. Additionally, ADB's just transition working group, uh, which is a you know a group, a, a working group inside the ADB, met with NGOs and labor groups in recent months to share plans on the just transition. I understand that our just transition team recently met with NGO forum on ADB and ITAC AP, your organization, to share the framework that is being developed. Please be assured uh, that we will conduct a thorough social assessment that keeps workers and communities in mind. And let me add once again that uh, uh, new energy policy uh, we uh, uh, adopted last year uh, commits uh, ADB uh, to support just transition for all the people in the affected community. So we are really, really, you know, uh, recognizing the uh, need to enhance just transition uh, component in our policy and our operation as much as possible. The third point was about decent work uh, in Sri Lanka. Yeah, but decent work is an important agenda not only uh, for Sri Lanka, but for all, all countries. Uh, it is part of the sustainable development goal number eight, uh, namely promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. ADB will support the creation of quality jobs in ADB's member countries through our operational priority number one, which says addressing remaining uh, poverty and reducing inequalities. We will identify uh, actions related to inclusive business, which supports access to services and opportunities, including quality jobs through 2030, our most inclusive business pro projects are expected to be in agriculture and rural development, education, health, urban services, value chain finance, and impact investment. A major objective of inclusive business projects will include job creation and provision of essential services. And finally, the fourth point. ADB currently has a position, as you know, of labor focal uh, based in our safeguard team. The safeguard team provide regular training of staff 
consultants and government counterparts in labor management capacity. Additionally, as part of the ADB's safeguard review, we will examine the additional support and resources that will be needed to strengthen the implementation of labor and working conditions in the new updated safeguard policy. As part of the policy update process, we will determine the expertise needed on house to support the policy. Finally, uh, you know, I, I was not asked, but let me make one comment on your you know, remarks on uh, DRM, domestic resource mobilization. Uh, you mentioned something like you know, tax uh, uh, base is eroded, uh, so there is no um, much room uh, for countries in our region uh, to raise tax revenue anymore. That's not really the case uh, for most countries in this region. Actually, if you look at uh, uh, the uh, tax to GDP uh, uh, ratio figure, uh, the, the figure in this region uh, is, has been uh, relatively low compared with the other uh, uh, area of the, of the world, uh, which means, which means uh, there is a still some room uh, for, to improve domestic tax mobilization, uh, you know, uh, to raise tax revenue by improving appropriate tax policy and or by uh, making tax administration, tax correction uh, exercise more efficiently, uh, for example, by using uh, digital uh, technology and so on. So I am of a view that, you know, uh, after this pandemic is over, after uh, the current challenges is over, I think, uh, you know, the timing will come to almost every country to change their gears from fiscal expansion, what we are doing now, uh, to fiscal consolidation. And uh, in that process of fiscal consolidation, of course, you know, countries should pick up the right timing to do so. It cannot be too uh, early, it cannot be too late. But in that process, I think DRM should play a very really, really, you know, significant uh, role, uh, in my view. And uh, ADB is most happy uh, to support a DRM effort of uh, our DMCs, Europe member countries, uh, in the process. So that's, that's just additional comments I'd like to make. Thank you, President Massa. It's really interesting discussions on uh, domestic resource mobilizations and the connection with uh, citizens uh, getting decent job, higher uh, quality job, and then uh, governments can uh, resource uh, mobilize locally. And thank you, Francis, for your questions. Um, they're, they're really interesting questions that can actually further be discussed later today at our uh, safeguard sessions at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, please register if you haven't done so. Uh, right now, at this time, I'd like to invite Mr. Hamanta Vitanaj, Executive Director of the Center for Environmental Justice, based in Sri Lanka. Hamanta, please introduce your organizations and share your issues and post the questions to the President. The floor is yours. Good morning, uh, Mr. President. I'm Hemant Vitanagi, representing Center for Environmental Justice based in Sri Lanka. On behalf of the NGO Forum and ADB and other civil society organizations, I thank you for providing this opportunity to meet the ADB management annually. This is a tradition ADB started many years ago, and I thank you for continuing this with the same spirit. This time we focus more on the crisis in Sri Lanka. As you are aware, Sri Lanka is in a deep debt crisis. We have lost food security, energy security, and created political crisis and social unrest. Women are more impacted by this situation. According to Relief Web, more than one third of the population is now facing acute food insecurity. Failed neoliberal policies and over-dependence on borrowings, especially borrowing from China and private creditors, heavy corruption, resulted in this crisis. On top of that, we are also hit by climate change and other issues. Sri Lanka is a founding member of the ADB. To date, ADB has committed 479 public sector loans, grants, and technical assistance, totaling 11 billion to Sri Lanka. A report prepared by the Center for Poverty Analysis on behalf of the ADB in 2007 concluded that together with the success stories, 
there were several reversals and failures of the ADB policies in the agriculture sector and several inconsistencies between government of Sri Lanka and ADB policies. Although ADB has put more lending to the transport, energy and agriculture, these sectors failed us. The main sources become for Sri Lanka become migration workers and tourism. When COVID impacted Sri Lanka, we lost both these incomes. Can the ADB still justify its role as a policy bank? ADB is repeating same of the some of the failures. Even at present, in an ongoing project in Sri Lanka, in the energy sector, ADB depends on the coal promoters as consultants to produce the renewable energy master plan. We know Sri Lanka has continued borrowing from private creditors and China since 2005 until we lose our debt sustainability by September 2020. There are many infrastructure projects which have not benefited the country. Some are now becoming illegitimate debt. Sri Lanka is not the only country in our region facing debt crisis. Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Nepal are also losing debt sustainability. In that case, ADB should revisit its approach on the development financing. Mr. President, investigating ADB loans to Sri Lanka from the lens of development effectiveness and debt crisis is paramount. We request ADB to run an IED evaluation on the failed projects and loans in Sri Lanka. On the issue of policy loans having direct impact on people and livelihood and environment, we demand new safeguards and clear binding language pertaining to holding policy loans accountable and should be subject to accountability mechanisms. As a regional bank, we also demand cancelling ADB failed loans to Sri Lanka. We are also calling to end all form of support to fossil fuel finance and coal finance through renewable energy development master plan or any indirect and direct financing. Mr. President, we are requesting the ADB to avoid a serious humanitarian crisis in Sri Lanka and in the region happening due to the debt crisis. I thank you. Thank you, Hamanta. Mr. President, the questions, there's three issues here that Hamanta raised. One is on debt sustainability. Two is on the uh, need for safeguards to extend even to policy-based loan. And the third is canceling loans for Sri Lanka. Yeah, thank you, Hamansa. ADB acknowledges uh, the urgent need uh, to address the debt sustainability in Sri Lanka. But, but as you rightly mentioned, not only Sri Lanka, but uh, also in a couple of other countries as well. And I'm, uh, uh, you know, I understand that right now uh, Sri Lanka is negotiating a so-called EFF uh, with IMF, and uh, uh, we are all hoping. Uh, that negotiation with IMF would be uh, really successfully concluded, uh, with uh, a very uh, uh, practical and uh, effective uh, policy action agreed between Sri Lanka and uh, IMF. Uh, during that time, ADB is uh, you know, continuously uh, providing uh, loan uh, by repurposing uh, uh, of the already existing loan in the, in the pipeline, and uh, also quite recently, uh, we uh, approved uh, emergency law uh, for the, uh, to address the emergency need uh, that uh, the Sri Lanka government uh, faces right now. And uh, if and when, uh, once, uh, you know, uh, 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 negotiation with IMF uh, is concluded, uh, we will further, uh, you know, consider to provide additional, you know, uh, uh, contributions uh, to stabilize the Sri Lanka economy along the lines uh, with the policy agreed by everybody. Um, so, uh, in, one, in one word, ADB, along with other um, MDBs, is playing a very important role in providing greater net flows, not debt, debt cancellation, but providing greater net flows to countries like Sri Lanka that need financing resources to counter the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and others. ADB, uh, through its concessional financing, can support low-income countries to meet their need uh, through grants, 
and advantageous loans to relieve a fiscal burden and increase government support to the most vulnerable people through food and income support. Uh, we have demonstrated this through the COVID-19 fiscal support to governments uh, to meet the social, economic, and health support to our member uh, countries' uh, population. Throughout our, our history, ADB's good uh, credit rating AAA uh, has enabled us uh, to support our members even in the most difficult economic and market conditions. We are relied upon to provide fresh and additional financial assistance uh, when other sources of credit are more difficult to access. So I do believe that, that's the role of uh, MDBs, including ADB. We are more interested in helping our member countries to develop social protection programs, particularly on food security, that build institutional resilience to shocks such as we are seeing today. In the short term, in 2022, ADB is mobilizing more than 3 billion in response uh, to address the food crisis uh, through a variety of actions, like including budget support, social protection, private sector response, and so on, but providing uh, financial resources. ADB also anticipated with other IFIs to release an IFI action plan to address food insecurity that was announced on the 18th of May. And your uh, proposal uh, to include uh, PBL and so on in the uh, uh, forthcoming safeguard is a very interesting idea. Uh, uh, actually, uh, we really need to strengthen uh, stakeholder engagement, including uh, everybody. Uh, so uh, let me look into uh, this issue, uh, which I feel a uh, quite interesting uh, proposal uh, from you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. President. And uh, Manta, I think you will be to get, uh, engaging with us later today on safeguards as well. So I think that's a really good question to discuss with our colleagues, our director of safeguards at that time. Uh, at this time, we have uh, the last speaker, but not the least, uh, Ms. Ritu Tapa, an advocate of Indigenous women's rights, treasurer and founding member of the Indigenous Women's Legal Awareness Group in Nepal. Ritu, please introduce your organization, and we would like to hear your presentation and question to the president. Over, you to, over to you, Ritu. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, respected president. Greetings from Nepal. Uh, thank you for this opportunity on behalf of the NGO Forum on ADV and other civil society organization. I'm advocate Ritu Thapa from Indigenous Women Legal Awareness Group, and Tanu is my native land. And I have been supporting to the Tanu Hyderabad affected community since 2016. As you know, Tanu Hyder Power Limited is co-financed by ADB, EIB, and the JICA. And the 73% of affected community belongs to indigenous community, and it is their ancestral land. The issues of communities are lack of adequate information sharing, informa uh, meaningful consultation and participation, and insufficient environmental and social assessment. Lack of fair and adequate compensation, discrepancy in compensation, they were not informed about land for land and house for house compensation, an inadequate grievance address mechanism, no participation of in local consultative forum, no information on safeguard policy and decision of indigenous people's plan, and Dalit committee is not uh, listed as affected uh, as their land is not registered, and the Bobo zone has not determined it, and not informed about additional revenues and services through benefit sharing schemes. And in July 2018, the committee filed a complaint to the ADP's OSPF, which was declared indecipherable. And then again in 12 February 2020, the committee filed complaints to the OSPF and the EIB complaint mechanism, which were found eligible. The committee are not happy with the long and exhausting process of OSPF. They were informed very short notice for the field visits of consultants experts. Information materials were not provided in advance. In August 2021, the committee was not consulted at all for the appointment of the land valuation study expert. Those SPF did not share with the committee the report of the land valuation study drafted in January 2022 until March citing serious disagreements of the THL on the study of that. The OSPF noted the preface to the report. The report was not even presented by the expert himself 
by the but by the local consultant when it was finally disclosed to the community. So, dear president, climate risk since the project began increased landslides, sand mining activities in that area. So they are not able to continue farming in their land and already started facing economical, environmental, and social crisis. I asked from the community side to stop the project till their grievances are addressed and they are properly rehabilitated. And most of the HB funded projects affected community is not aware of complaint mechanism procedure in absence of meaningful consultation. So how will the HB ensure, make sure that it will not repeat in future again with other projects in Nepal? And ADB has been respecting the human rights and tried to protect the rights of indigenous and marginalized and vulnerable community in one side and another side continuously financing the dam projects. Then how will the ADB ensure to protect and promote the human rights by financing the projects? I hope the ADB will take this note seriously and respect the human rights of affected indigenous, marginalized and vulnerable communities soon. Thank you very much, President. Thank you, Ritu. Ritu, that's really, really, um, uh, I think, um, very significant questions you're asking. And I think we have uh, a, a whole uh, 90 minutes dedicated to that later today. So I think further the questions will be discussed there. Uh, but uh, the questions Ritu asked, Mr. President, is about the Tanahu hydropower project and uh, what will ADB do to include more uh, voices of indigenous people and, and be inclusive in the consultation process uh, for the safeguards uh, process. Um, I understand that Tanahu project is currently under the OSPF uh, review, and I think our uh, Mr. President may have some information on that. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. President. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah thank you, Ritsu, uh, for bringing your concern uh, to my attention. I am aware uh, that our teams are in dialogue with you and other concerned groups on this uh, issue. Uh, I understand our teams from the South Asia Department and from the Office of Special Project Facilitator, so-called OSPF, uh, have had several uh, virtual, fiscal, and blended fact-finding missions uh, with complainants uh, to understand and address the issue. Uh, please expect further action once OSPF has finalized uh, the dispute resolution framework agreement. Uh, we do hope to continue our open dialogue with concerned groups until we come to a resolution of this concern. Uh, we appreciate uh, that you are using our accountability, accountability mechanism and the grievance and redress mechanism. These are very important avenues to raise the views and clarify the impacts of ADB supported projects on affected communities. Uh, full compliance uh, with our own safeguard policy is also a ne non-negotiable component of all ADB-supported projects. ADB is in the process of, of updating the policy, as I mentioned, to further strengthen the environment, indigenous people, and resettlement safeguards, as well as tackle possible new standards on climate change. I do hope uh, your organization and partner communities are participating in this safeguard review process actively. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Ritu, Ritu for your questions. Um, we have a few minutes left. I think we can probably get one or two questions from the uh, pigeon hole chat. Um, the first question we have coming through uh, and been voted by you is a question about just transition. Uh, and the question is, will ADB move away from funding large hydropower projects and maybe uh, that, that projects that are harmful to communities and instead focus on a community-led uh, energy solution, a smaller scale energy solutions perhaps? Mr. President. Okay, just in transition, we, we, di we discussed today a bit about just transition, uh, but there are inevitably, you know, individuals communities uh, the, uh, the, uh, which are uh, adversely uh, affected uh, by uh, low carbon transition. So we have to make sure uh, that uh, uh, no one is left behind and uh, uh, cost and benefit of just transition should be distributed fairly among uh, every relevant uh, people and communities. 
uh, as I mentioned, uh, our new energy policy uh, commit to ADB uh, to uh, support just transition uh, for all the people in the affected communities. Uh, so we are doing our best. Uh, uh, you know, whatever it is, whatever it's a hydro project, whatever it is, you know, uh, even renewable energy and so on, uh, this, uh, you know, issue needs to be addressed properly uh, under our new policy. Uh, so, uh, it's not really depends on the size only, but depends on the demand of the society and also demand of the people. So from every angle, uh, we uh, would like to, you know, make sure uh, that the just, just transition be uh, realized properly. Thank you, President Massa. Yes, um, hydropower project is um, is actually uh, one of the, the big interests of civil society groups and the need for engaging and, and be more inclusive in the process for uh, engaging with uh, civil society and indigenous and stakeholders members. I think the discussion on stakeholders um, and, and the conversation uh, is the discussion to need to strengthen that in the safeguards will be further discussed this afternoon. So I encourage all of you to tune in this afternoon to, to hear the lively discussion there. Um, with another, uh, this it seems to be very popular today, questions on safeguards. As you know, ADB is going through the, the safeguards um, policy review process. Another question asked is about the inclusion agenda, how ADB will aim to be more inclusive in our consultation process and in the new safeguard policies, um, how we aim to uh, include other other social groups, like the president mentioned before, gender, um, with the inclusion of LGBT communities uh, to ADB projects. Um, I think the the uh, the question there is: Will ADB safeguards policy include LGBTQ uh, into the the new policy, um, uh, Mr. President? Will we include the LGBTQ as part of our inclusion agenda? Okay, uh, let me <laughs> respond to your question more in general. Uh, in the context of revision of uh, safeguard policy, uh, we are uh, right now working on. ADB envisions a new policy uh, uh, that is broader in scope. It may strengthen our work in several areas, including one, uh, with standards on labor and working conditions, decent work, for example, uh, that build on our two, uh, 2001 uh, social protection strategy. And two, uh, with a more uh, prominent focus on gender issues. Uh, this would include attention to gender-based violence and sexual orientation and gender identity risks, SOGI risks. The policy would also focus on vulnerable and disadvantaged groups. And three, uh, with strengthened stakeholder engagement, this would incorporate stakeholder identification and mapping. So wider you know, uh, scope of people would be involved, should be involved. And fourth, uh, with possible new standards on climate change, this is another important aspect of the new you know, safeguard policy. Uh, this would focus on climate risk and vulnerability and related assessments. They would also cover climate change uh, mitigation. For example, we would aim to uh, quantify project level greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we have uh, one minute left, and I have uh, one quick question here, uh, another one to add to the discussion. Um, the, this one is about the realities of uh, human rights defenders and voices of uh, people who are facing reprisals. And, uh, and, and the question is, will AD adopt a zero tolerance, tolerance pro policy on intimidation and reprisal built into the proposal safeguard policies? There's a concern about the closing of uh, civic space for um, stakeholders to engage. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, let me stress that human dignity, uh, integration and equal opportunities are core value in ADB's uh, development agenda. Uh, these led to improved development outcomes. And that is why uh, we have strong policies on anti-corruption, information disclosures, and safeguards as well. It is also why we have an, an accountability mechanism as part of project implementation. 
we respond regularly uh, to the individual appeals we receive through those already existing very, very reliable and sophisticated mechanisms inside the bank. Thank you, Mr. President. This, is, this has been an excellent session, and we've managed to get in a lot of questions from you. And thank you again for all of you for being a part of our dialogue today. Um, if you did not, we did not get to your questions, please tune in this afternoon and speak with our uh, Director of Policies and, and Safeguards Policy and, and the NGO community further on the safeguard this discussion. Thank you, President Massa, for listening and responding to all of the questions. And we appreciate all of your perspectives. And thank you for spending your time with us to converse on very important development issues facing our region today. With that, I thank you and wish you a good day. Thank you very much.